and he went into the he searched one by one each place but practically nowhere could he find sita and he went in all the chambers he was searching and as he was searching searching nowhere and all the palaces almost were executed exhausted and it was night and he had used the advantage of the night because even if it was small lanka was a well fortified place so in the day time he is being detected to be much easier so he was searching and after he searched all the palaces he got disheartened that then started thinking what should i do now he had already done a super human effort to jump across the ocean and come all the way but now it's you know, when we when we put in a lot of effort to try to achieve something and then we don't get it then the disappointment and frustration are much more than if we don't try much for it it's something okay if i get it good if i don't get it doesn't matter it's okay i don't get it get it let's move on with life but something which is very important something which we have put in a lot of energy to get it also and then we don't get it so what do you do at that time so at that time he he was so disheartened he started thinking what will happen if i don't find sita what will happen he started thinking if i go back now if i go back and i tell the monkeys and we go back and tell sugriva and then sugriva tells ram i think ram he had already seen you know how much agony ram was because of separation from sita this is ram will not be able to maintain his life and if ram gives up his life lakshman will give up his life if lakshman uh, ram and lakshman give up his life sugriva will feel that i i was responsible i failed ram did his part in our agreement he helped me get back my kingdom and my life but i could not help him find sita so sugri will feel that he has failed to honor his word and further on top of that the loss of ram the, de- the demise of ram will devastate sugri and sugri will give up his life and sugri will give up his life all the monkeys will become disheartened and either the monkeys will themselves give up the life or they will lose all heart and kishkinda will be attacked by some enemies in the world enemies are always waiting for an opportunity to pounce and then kishkinda will be destroyed and if the news reaches bharat even bharat will be destroyed will be disheartened and even the yodhya vasis will sink into the ocean of distress and devastation either they will give up their lives or again invaders will destroy them also he said because of my failure two entire kingdoms will be destroyed this is no not possible he says i will find sita i no matter what happens i will find sita so what happened over here was he said immediately somehow or other i will find sita so basically for each one of us when we when we face discouragement in life and everybody faces discouragement we may try something very a uh, lot of effort to do something and still it doesn't work out and it's understandable it's entirely human to become discouraged when something which you're putting a lot of effort and it doesn't work but broadly speaking we have two options when we face discouraging obstacles either we become resentful and we give up or we become determined and push on now it's interesting it's been observed in nature and it's been observed even by psychologists that generally if two people face the same problem now one person collapses the other person doesn't, doesn't collapse now what is the difference you may say this person mentally tougher but what do you mean by mentally tougher is it like uh, some people are, are mentally tougher and some people are say mentally weaker 
what does it mean actually there can be many aspects but one basic point is our attitude say if somebody let's consider that somebody has to carry some luggage now if they have to carry some big weight i don't want to carry it but they somehow try to dodge it escape it and still they are forced to carry it now they may carry it halfway along and they may not even carry it fully or even if they carry it at the end of it they will only feel irritated and the person for whom they were carrying that person will also be irritated on the other hand if someone if someone is facing if someone say goes to a gym and they lift up weight now what has happened the weight might more or less be similar in quantity similar in burden but if they lift up that weight and do the exercise their muscles will they will become fitter so the burden might be the same but the way we approach the burden now you cannot avoid the burden if it is there but the way we approach the burden will shape what happens to us because of the burden so at that point if we are seeing okay this is a burden so similarly this is obstacle this is so much trouble but expansion means look beyond the problem to the bigger picture so what happens is uh, now this problem is there i have a choice either i can be resentful and give up or i can't give up the problem is already there either i resentful and i just lose myself in self pity or i become determined and do the best that i can now sometimes our life is such that our best may not be enough and we may still go down that particular thing may not work out but in the bigger picture for our growth if we take a attitude that this is let me see this as a challenge let me try to persevere then that will at the very least ensure that we don't hurt ourselves more than what life is hurting us the weight is already there on me and if i'm going to resent the weight still the weight is going to be there it's only going to hurt me more so but if we take it okay let me do the best that i can in this situation so voluntarily accepted challenge is is very conducive for our growth now we could put this in another different way when we face discouragement and we may want life to be comfortable we all want life to be happy but actually pleasure is too cheap a purpose for a satisfying life i'll repeat this pleasure is too cheap a purpose for a satisfying life what do i mean if pleasure is there already satisfaction is there no so imagine you can think of some very uh, very basic levels of pleasure say if now some people like to watch comedy shows mm-hmm. now of course everybody likes humor in some sense but suppose if we had no financial responsibility no family responsibilities and some told for the rest of your life just enjoy watching comedy shows throughout the day for the rest of your life and would we enjoy it well maybe for some time it's fun but after that we want to do something but i want something to do in my life so the point is pleasure we all want in a sense pleasure but pleasure is too cheap a purpose to make life satisfying we may not think of it that way because we all want to be happy but actually what we really want is not just pleasure we want something challenging meaningful to do in our life now pleasure is best experienced as a by product of something meaningful not just a product at least when we do something to get pleasure usually most of the times if we consider the search for pleasure is the cause of the greatest trouble how do people get addicted they are searching simply for pleasure nobody eh, there is no challenge in drinking alcohol or staying in drugs or whatever so what happens 
it said with respect to alcohol first the drinker takes a drink then the drink takes a drink and then the drink takes the drinker <laughs> people get hooked that way so now what has happened if you consider millions of people today are addicted or very many many different things so now nobody is born from their mother's womb with a bottle of alcohol in their hands <laughs> is it so they drank it because they wanted some pleasure but often if we just seek pleasure divorced from anything meaningful then that search for pleasure itself becomes a cause of trouble so what we want in life is we all want happiness but happiness is best experienced as a by product so we do something meaningful and when we do something meaningful at the end of doing that meaningful thing when we get something satisfying that is real satisfaction say if we study for an exam and then we pass that exam so you know if somebody didn't study for the exam and then got a degree now it is possible in many places to maybe in india in some parts you just get a fake degree well you can parade it to the world but you neither learn much nor do you really get the satisfaction of having done something meaningful in life so for our so what happens when we are facing obstacles which discourage us we start we are thinking this is so much trouble why should there be so much trouble in my life i just want a trouble free life yeah it's nobody wants unnecessary trouble of course but the point is just a trouble free life is not a joyful life a trouble free life is not a joyful life necessarily if there is if our life is just trouble free then soon we will do something which will fill our life with trouble <laughs> that is the way we are we are psychologically made in such a way that if we if we have a trouble free life in fact you know most people who get addicted what's happening is that they, before addiction they may not have much troubles okay all has some, everybody has some problems but when we are trouble free we will seek pleasure and we will court trouble by that so so rather than so the expansion means look at the big picture the look big, big picture is a okay, like i said oh i have to carry this weight Shh, this is a bird but either i can carry it resentfully or i can say okay this weight which i am lifting which can strengthen my muscles so let me carry it purposefully let me carry it with determination so at that point the weight is a bird but if i am looking only at that weight at that point it is feel unbearable bird but expand means look at the big picture that yes this is trouble right now but just avoiding trouble or getting pleasure is not what will make life meaningful let me face this trouble voluntarily as a means to grow now sometimes you might be able to solve that problem also sometimes you may not be able to solve that problem but just that expansion of vision will give us more energy or at least the energy that is being depleted internally the depletion will stop okay so this was the first point what are three points i am discussing does anyone remember expansion elevation execution yeah so the first point is expansion any quick comments or questions about this yes please yes yeah pleasure is short lived definitely it depends on what kind of pleasure is generally the more the pleasure is external to us the physical pleasure is very short lived maybe mental or intellectual pleasure is more long lived spiritual pleasure is eternally lived so different kinds of pleasures have different longevity Okay, that's interesting. Pleasure is a madman's happiness. Okay, and happiness is a devotee's pleasure. Thank you. Yes. So let's move on. The second, yeah, yeah. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, as you said, you know, uh, if a person goes to a gym and he picks it up with a purpose, then he gets the. But you have to have the will, no? 
So, you know, if, if lifting weights can help our muscles to grow, but we have to have the will first to lift the weight. Yes, that's true, but then broadly you could say that we have only two options in life. One is that we do what we desire or we desire what we do. Either we do what we desire. This is what, our, what I, this is what I want to do, I am going to do it, whatever happens. But sometimes there is just no path for us to do what we desire. We just have to do something else. Then it is better that we desire what we do. So we can say that I don't have the will. But then will is something which can be also created, it can also be cultivated. So if I have to go through some experience, then either I can go through that experience Drag, being dragged by my feet through it and I'll have to go through it, I'll be miserable through it. Let me try to go through it the best way that I can. So all of us have that capacity to at one level accept the situation that we are in. So suppose we fall sick and we are told we have fallen sick and the next one week you'll have to stay in bed. Now we may have dozens of plans of what we want to do in the next week. But everything is disrupted and we are on bed. Now, anyway, I have to be on bed. So I can either ask, uh, be resentful, why did the sickness come upon me? Why did the sickness come upon me? Why did the sickness come upon me? Come upon me? And I just, as I said, life is hurting at that time. But by resenting, we can increase the hurt. Mm -hmm. But if, okay, but if, so now I can't do what I desire. Oh, I have to go here, I want to meet this person. But all those plans I can't do. Then desire what you do. Okay, suppose now I am on bed. Okay, while I am on bed, what can I do? Maybe I can read something, maybe I can hear something. Maybe I can, some people they want to talk, I can talk with them on the phone or whatever. You know, do whatever I have to do in that situation, accept that and try to do that. For that also, you have to have the understanding, you know what I am trying to say? You have to have the understanding of this philosophy. You know, you know in life, when real life problems come, and one after the other, there are discouragements and you are not achieving your purpose, you give up. Yeah. People do give up, I've seen. And they are like devotees. They, they know the philosophy. But then, you know what my question is, like, you know, practically, what you are saying is absolutely correct. But when a situation comes, are you able to apply this? That I want to learn from you. Yeah, so there are two different things. Your difficulties come. We just, one after another, many difficulties come, we give up. Yeah, that's a normal human reaction. At the same time, life goes on. So it's like, we could say, uh, if suddenly a big fire breaks out somewhere. Now, even trained firefighters, when they see a huge fire, they may be alarmed. Now, a novice firefighter or an ordinary citizen, when they see a fire, big fire, they might not just be alarmed, they might become panicky. They just run helter-skelter here, there and get, get completely overwhelmed. In fact, they might come in the way of those who are trying to fight the fire. A novice firefighter, a novice firefighter, they may also get alarmed. Now the difference between a seasoned firefighter and a novice firefighter is not that a seasoned firefighter doesn't get alarmed. That's just a normal human reaction. But the whole point of their training, their discipline is that their firefighter instincts kick into place quickly. And the alarm stays, but it doesn't stay for long. Okay, this fire like this, what can you do? You know, this part of the building is gone. We can't save this. But this is what we can save. The building is going to fall, but maybe if we can check if somebody is there, we can go in. The next five minutes we can go in and rescue some people. So basically, I'll come a little later to the part of execution and the last part. But the point is that we all when we feel when we feel when we feel too many difficulties it is natural to be discouraged but what is the what is the solution after the problem is there as it is if i become discouraged i am only making my life worse life is going to go on 
and I have to live on. So that alarm, that sense of discouragement that will come. But if we have a bigger picture of life, that you know, life is much bigger than this particular situation. We can, uh, we can look at our own lives and the Bhagavad Gita tells us we are not the body with the soul. What it essentially means is that life is not like a hundred meter sprint. It is like a hundred mile marathon. So yes, this is a difficult situation and it is terrible that the situation has come. But if you look at our own lives with the expanded vision, we have all gone through many difficulties. And when the, if you look back at five years before in your life, you think of what are the problem facing you. There is some big problem facing you at that time also. But you have gone through it now. So it is natural that when a problem hits, we will be overwhelmed. But we, we needn't stay overwhelmed by it. And to the extent we have done some spiritual practices, not just as a ritual, but we have done spiritual practices to actually make our consciousness spiritual. Then that alarm, that discouragement will come, but it won't stay for that long. Rather, okay, let me move forward in my life. Okay, Hare Krishna. Okay, so what was the second point we are going to discuss? Elevation, yes. So expansion means see the big picture that yes, this problem is there, but this problem, either I can see this simply as a burden or I can see it as a challenge for my growth. Now elevation means it's a different perspective. One is I see that this is meant this this is maybe there's something good which will come for me, this is some for my growth. But elevation means we don't just look ahead, we look up. Now we look up means that uh, we, we understand that there is a bigger plan governing the world. There is a bigger purpose for life in the world. Now you may say, oh, this is just your religious sentiment. Yeah, possibly. Today afternoon I am doing a youth meeting where I am talking on the speaker, uh, topic, speaking on the topic of why atheism requires more faith than theism. Some people say, I don't have enough faith to faith to believe in God. My answer is, I don't have enough faith to believe in atheism. And atheism requires far more faith. How is that? You say, why does atheism require faith? You say, athe- to believe that some God is there, that requires faith. But to, to say there is no God, how, does it, how do you require faith? See, actually, nobody lives practically like an atheist. What do we mean live like an atheist? All of us, we live our life as if there is some cause-effect connection. That there is some sense of meaning to life. Say for example, when Newton saw the fruit falling uh, many centuries ago, he asked what made the fruit fall? Now what that means is that question itself means that understood things don't happen by chance. There is some kind of order in the world. I suppose one day your child comes back from school and he's got a black eye. Say, what happened? I just got a black eye. What do you mean? How did you get a black eye? Did you hit something? Did you fight with someone? No, I just got a black eye. See, nobody functions like that, isn't it? We all accept that there is a cause-effect correlation. In fact, the whole science is largely a search for cause-effect correlation. Why do what makes things happen the way they are? So now it's like if we take the if we take the atheistic worldview, which claims to be scientific, but actually atheism is not scientific. Atheism is just a belief system which is parasitical on science, which claims that it is derived from science. But atheism is an entirely different belief system. So what happens in atheism? We have islands of meaning. You know, why do apples why do apples fall? Oh, that's because of gravity. No, why does the temperature rise? Oh, because of that is the laws of thermodynamics. Oh, why is this part lit and this part not lit? That's because of the laws of electricity. Okay. Oh, we have islands of meaning while drowning in an ocean of meaninglessness. What does that mean? Okay, why does this happen like this? Why does this happen like this? Why does it happen like this? We have all answers. But why do we exist? Life has no purpose. In fact, one, uh, one Steven Weinberg, Nobel laureate physicist, he said that the more the universe becomes understandable, the more it seems meaningless. Oh, this is completely 
illogic it's like say if somebody has scribbled some message has written some message for you and it's something in some foreign language and you work very hard and okay what is the script what does this letter mean what does this word mean what does this word mean now you work very hard and understand the script understand the letters understand the words and then at the end of it you find that the whole message is meaningless maybe i am missing something if somebody has written something in a careful script they have formed letters they have formed words they have formed sentences so more the message becomes understandable the more it should be meaningful and if somebody is saying the more we understand the universe the more it is meaningless then that means we are missing something in the universe so atheists or theists life's problems are there for everyone now life is tough i have traveled across the world many times now and talk with many people who are very successful they may appear to be very successful but you just scrape a little below the surface and everybody is working through their own tragedies now somebody has a parent who has got dementia and they can't even recognize them somebody has lost a relative to painful cancer now everybody is working through their own tragedies so life is tough for everyone atheism does not remove any problems for you atheism only removes the hope that the problems have some purpose and atheism does not remove any problems but atheism only removes the hope that the problems have some purpose so elevation means we understand yes whatever is happening in the world sometimes bad things do happen but there is a higher plan and in that plan whatever is happening it has a purpose so bad things do happen in life some people say that everything that happens is good but some people claim that this is a teaching of the bhagavad gita also but i have read the bhagavad gita many times i have never found this anywhere the people say jo hua wo acha hua jo ho raha hai wo acha ho raha hai jo hone wala hai wo bhi acha hi hoga now this is never said in the bhagavad gita anywhere what the bhagavad gita is talking about is how uh, what how we are responding to life when draupadi is being dishonored nobody goes and tells her jo hua wo acha hua no it's actually horrible things happen in life and to say that everything that happens is good is is monstrously cruel when cruel things have happened when terrible things have happened in life but what we can say is everything that happens is not good but everything that happens can be for good bad things happen but from the bad things good can emerge and we see that is how things work in nature everywhere if you see how things work in nature that whatever is existing the existing order needs to be broken for something better to emerge the clouds look beautiful in the sky but the clouds have to be broken so that rains come the rains they <clears throat> when they make the soil for the earth fertile at that time the earth needs to be plowed which means it to be broken so that irrigation can take place when the harvest grows the harvest needs to be cut when we have the grains the grains need to be ground so that we can have flour which can be used for eating when we make bread or chapatis the chapati has been broken that's when we can get nutrition sometimes when we take prasad that do do how sometimes you notice they arrange the plate in such a artistic way that you feel as if taking prasad is committing violence to this art <laughs> <laughs> but you know if you don't do that you will not be able to get any nutrition So the point is that we see throughout nature that whatever is existing, it has to be broken so that something better can come out of it. That is the way things work. So elevation means that there is a higher plan, and whatever we are going through, that there is. I am going. This is difficult, but it's all for a purpose. Something will emerge from it. And elevation means if I keep doing my best. so the lord will do the rest 
So as Hanuman was thinking what to do, he was he was determined. I am going to search for Sita, but he had searched everywhere, and as his thoughts had become gloomy, the night had also become completely gloomy. That the moon had hidden behind the clouds, the stars had also gone behind the clouds. It was completely gloomy. But as he became determined, let me do my best. I am going to find Sita. I will die till I find Sita. But I will not give up. Now, as soon as he thought like that, suddenly the cloud, the clouds parted, and the moon came out of the clouds. And as he was looking at the moonlight, he looked around, and suddenly he saw a garden. And now, initially, he had thought that Sita is the princess and Ravana is the king. So Sita would be in a palace, and he had served all, all the palaces. But when he saw this garden, suddenly he would have oh, he says, maybe Sita is here. And then he remembered how after Sugriva became the king, at that time Sugriva had invited Ram. During the four months of Chaturmas, when the rains were heavy, we can't surge, please come and stay in my kingdom. So Ram had said, that I am in one world. I am in exile. I cannot come in any kingdom. Not just Ayodhya, but no kingdom. So I will stay in the forest. So yeah. even Lakshman had done the same thing. Although Lakshman had not been exiled, only Ram had been exiled. So then Hanuman thought, maybe Sita refused to stay in any palace. Maybe she is in this forest. Maybe she is in this park. She is in the garden. She is in this forest. And suddenly, a surge of energy came upon him. So elevation means, when he made the determination, I am going to persevere. Then, another option opened for him. The moon came, pa, moon came out, and not only the moon came out, the moon showed him a way ahead. So for all of us, when we, when we are looking ahead, and all that we are seeing is a blocked road for us, we just don't see anything ahead then you need to look up at that time. Now, sometimes that road may be unmovable and you might have to go towards some other road. Hanuman would have chosen, let me look, search all the palaces once again, maybe I missed something. But yeah, that was not working, but he was open. Okay, this road is not working, let me look here. His purpose was the same, but the path, the choosing was different. Stop searching the palaces, start looking at the gardens. So for all of us, similarly, this elevation means that yes, this difficulty is there and it's terrible. I, I find it very, very difficult to hear. But it is all for a higher purpose. There is a higher plan. Through whatever is happening in my life, there is a higher plan. And again, somebody might say, why should I believe in the idea of some higher plan? But the point is, why should you not believe there is a higher plan? If you see for our very existence, there is some higher plan that is required. You may say, for what higher plan? If I don't work at my job, I won't get any food. Where is the higher plan? Well, even if you work at your job, unless a higher plan provides us water, air, then we can't live. So our very existence requires things which are beyond our existence. So it's like, we do have to work, no doubt. But our endeavor is secondary. It's like every morning when the birds rise and the birds start chirping. Where, is, where are grains? Where are grains? The birds have to search. But the birds searching does not produce the grains. The birds searching only helps them to find the grains that are already provided by God. So our efforts are required, no doubt. But our efforts are secondary. Our very existence primarily requires something beyond our existence. So elevation when we do and when we, when we come to a temple, when we do satsang, when we do our japa, when we do our puja, it's not just a religious ritual that we are doing. It's actually meant to all elevate our consciousness. Yes, this whole world is there, all the problems are there, but Krishna is there, bigger than this world, beyond this world. And Krishna has a plan. So let me do my part. So the discouraging situation is still there. One is, we ourselves think, if I face it wholeheartedly, I will grow. That's, that's expansion. But elevation means, it's not just I facing against a blind world or a cruel world, but this, this world has some higher plan. 
So let me try to do my part in that plan. And that brings us to the last part. E is what? Last E, remember? Execution. So execution means that when we have, when we are faced with some difficult situation, at that time, it's important that, uh, now earlier I said expansion in terms of look at the big picture to understand that is a purpose. But execution, whether I'm going to execute something, at that time, focus on the small picture. What can I do right now? Now, when we are having very, when we are going through unmanageably difficult times, if we start thinking what will happen to me after one year, what will happen to me after 10 years, what will happen to me after three years, well, in those difficult times, there are too many variables going on. Say if somebody has got some very difficult disease, somebody has just lost a job, somebody has a relationship crumbling, then we start thinking too long term, there are so many variables that we can't do much at that time. So execution means focus on small steps. Focus on small steps. That mean, what does it mean by small steps? That, okay, can I act for the next one hour or for the next one day? Can I act in a way that won't make things worse? Can I act in a way that, to the best of my capacity, you know, this is happening, I'm feeling like crying, I'm feeling like screaming, I'm feeling like beating someone. But, no. Can I, if I could be at my, at my best for the next one day, or one day feels to be the next one hour, just reduce the time frame to a manageable unit. And then, if we can act to the best of our capacity for one hour, then stop and just appreciate it. Good that you didn't make a mess. Didn't make a mess of things. See, when the world discourages us, we need to encourage ourselves. When the world discourages us, it is we who need to encourage ourselves. And encouragement doesn't mean, oh, everything is wonderful. It's not an artificial utopia. It's just that when we do what is right to the best of our capacity, yes, I can. At least for one hour, I will do, I will work, will do avoid making a mess. That's good. Good, you did this. Now let's do the next step. So, go oh, divide it into small manageable units. Sometimes, uh, I'll conclude with this point now with respect to discouragement, that <clears throat> when we are discouraged, we feel that I am powerless. There is absolutely nothing I can do in this situation. Have any of you felt like this? Sometimes in a situation, there is nothing you can do. Always. <laughs> I am trapped in this situation. I just can't do anything. We often feel like this. Now, now, this sense of powerlessness is something which we need to challenge. Now, how do we challenge that? In no matter how bad things are, can I make them worse? <laughs> you say, who will want to make them worse? <laughs> They're already very bad. And that's fine. I'm not saying we should actually make them worse. But just ask yourself the question, can I make them worse? You know, I might I might be, I have a fractured leg and I'm lying in bed, not able to do anything. But even on bed, am I powerless? And I can take a hammer and crack my other knee Isn't it? <laughs> Obviously, I shouldn't do that. But the point is, we are never as powerless as we think. If we can make things worse, then we can make them better. So execution means focus on taking one step. So Hanuman had no guarantee that he's going to find Sita. And he had searched everywhere, but the moon showed this forest, showed this garden, and immediately ran towards that. And he crept in and he was searching, searching in that garden. And soon, he saw Ravana. It was all night he had searched, and he couldn't find anything. And then, early morning, he saw Ravana going in a particular direction. I said, what is he doing over here? this garden. Now, Ravan was not looking like a person who has just come out for a nice morning walk. You know, we're fresh and getting some fresh air. He, you know, all night he had been craving for Sita and he had tried to sate his desire with others but not satisfied. And he was again going early in the morning to try to persuade Sita or threaten Sita. So as he marched angrily, you know, somebody, people go for a morning walk, they're going, it's a pleasant jolly mood but he was just pounding his feet, going angrily. Hanuman's name we read. And Hanuman, and as Ravan, he came. Sita, if you don't surrender to me, I will kill you. And although those words
words are very threatening, just the word Sita. And one understood that Sita has been found. So, he just kept searching, small, small, small steps. So, execution is, you know, for us, no matter how difficult the situation that we are in, there is always something in our control. And the most basic level is our consciousness that is in our control. Some people, they, they fall very sick. At that time, it's, it's being sick is painful. But sometimes when they're sick, people start complaining, they start snapping at others, they start yelling at others. Now they are sick and they make people sick of them. <laughs> <laughs> now, at the very least, you can avoid that. Okay, I'm sick right now, but let me focus my consciousness. Let me, okay, how can I be as well behaved as possible in this situation for the next one hour for the next one day so if we can we can make uh, we can set a realistic goal that is possible for us to do now one way to avoid failure is to set a goal in which we can't fail <laughs> what does that mean okay for the next one hour can i do can i behave myself properly okay yeah, next one hour i can do that so do that and appreciate yourself so for exec execution, I'll conclude this part of the now. SSS, it is small, simple steps. Take some small, simple steps. Just start with that and things will move forward. Things will move forward. Things will move forward. So when we do that, we will find that no matter how much discouragement we are in our life, whatever difficulties we are facing, the difficulties are we may feel I am lost in this dark thing and this is a dungeon in which I am trapped for the rest of my life. But no matter how dark it is, it's not a dungeon. It's a tunnel. And if you keep walking, keep walking, we will come out of the tunnel. We will find the light at the end of the tunnel. The Lord will take us to light beyond the darkness. The world can hurt us in many ways, but greater than the world's power to hurt, is Krishna's power to heal. Greater than the world's power to hurt is Krishna's power to heal. So by expansion, elevation and <coughs> execution, if we turn towards Krishna's power to heal, not focus on obsess over the world's power to hurt, we'll find that through even difficult situations, Krishna will lead us through from darkness to light. Tamasoma Jyotirgama. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. Now how to deal with discouragement with three points. <clears throat> uh, first, of all, expansion. So when we we all face discouragement, and discouragement is like if you're driving a, a car and we face an external obstacle, it becomes difficult for us to move on. But if our fuel runs out, then obstacle no obstacle, we can't move on. So life's problems are like the external log falling on the path of our life journey. But we running out of fuel is like internally can be discouraged. So now the two are related. At the bigger the obstacle, the more our fuel may get exhausted trying to push forward. But the obstacles don't necessarily have to cause discouragement. So encouragement is our energy and we need that to move forward in life. And how do we develop that? Talked about first was expansion. Expansion means that instead of just obsessing, why is this obstacle there? Now look at the bigger picture to see that this is meant for my growth. Or at least I can grow by, by looking at this positively, purposefully. So uh, if we just have to lift a burden and we don't want to, we might do it reluctantly, we won't do it well, we won't please anyone, we will be annoyed. Life has hurt us, but we will hurt ourselves more by our attitude. But if we are going to a gym and we lift the same weight, but that if we lift it, it strengthens us. So like that, life's burdens, if we see them as meant for some purpose, meant for our growth, then we can move forward. Uh, we can grow through that. And generally, life's burdens mean that we have no pleasure, but we have trouble. So when we resent the absence of pleasure and the presence of trouble, we can remind ourselves that pleasure is too cheap a purpose to make life satisfying. What we want is not just pleasure as a product, we want actually pleasure that comes as a byproduct of something meaningful. So we won't be satisfied watching comedies for the rest of our life. So we can see that, okay, I'm not having, in fact, just the search for pleasure often becomes the cause of the biggest trouble. 
So instead of resenting the trouble, okay, or the loss, or resenting the loss of pleasure, you can see, okay, there is some purpose for my growth over here. And we move forward. So see the big picture. Expand yourself to see that, okay, I have faced, this trouble is very big, but I have faced many troubles in the past. And I not only have survived through them, but I have grown through them. So through this also I have survived and grown. The second was elevation. That means that we don't just look ahead, but look up. That, that there is a plan for everything in life. Atheism can't explain, atheism offers us islands of meaning. This is why this happened, this is why this happened, this is why this happened. By drowning us in the ocean of meaninglessness. Life has no meaning. So, it, it, atheism does not remove any problems. It only removes the hope that the problems have a purpose. So, if we choose to have that faith that there is a higher purpose, everything that happens is not good, but it can be for good. Then we can persevere. And our, we say, who, what is, isn't this just faith? Yes, it is faith, but it's intelligent faith. Because our very existence requires uh, something bigger than us, something beyond us, uh, the provision of air, water, everything like that. And often, in this higher plan, the existing things have to be broken for something better to emerge. From clouds to rains, from soil to grains, from grains to flour, from flour to food, from food to digested energy. So like that, sometimes similarly, our plans may be broken, but something better will emerge from that. And last was execution. That means when we have to do things, don't focus on too big a picture. Just focus at that time on small, simple steps. For the next one day, can I avoid making things worse? Can I, do, can I be at my best for one day? And if you are able to set a small, simple step and achieve that, then appreciate yourself. That when life discourages us, we need to encourage ourselves by doing something which is value, worth appreciating, worth getting encouraged. And if you feel utterly powerless, then we can challenge that power, sense of powerlessness by asking ourselves, no matter how bad things are, can't I make them worse? I can. That means I can make them better. And for us, Krishna consciousness, helps us to see that picture, big picture. I am a soul, so it expands our consciousness. And Krishna exists as a Supreme Lord, so it helps us to elevate our consciousness. And further by exhaustion, we understand that Krishna is there with us, ready to help us. And the small, simple steps we can keep taking, and then whatever difficulty we are going through that is discouraging us, we'll see that it's not a dungeon, but it's a tunnel through which we'll emerge stronger and purer in our connection with Krishna. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Yeah. Questions? I have a question. Yes, please. Do we have time? Yes, yeah. Hare Krishna. We have five minutes time. You said expansion, elevation, and execution. That's in slow motion is nice. But if accidents happen, why if problem comes to you like that, then you are you are you are blind. You don't have time to do baby steps and thinking about You have to act. Yeah. Or you uh, or you plan. So How when problems problems situation? come suddenly, yeah, then we do that. All problem comes suddenly only, and then you get black out. No, that's why I said that firefighter example. We might black out for a few minutes. That's understandable. You know, it's it's entirely understandable. When Prabhupada was hit by a cow when he was walking along, trying to restore back to God. You know, Prabhupada told one of his disciples, he said, I asked Krishna, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to me? So, is it, uh, was Prabhupada doubting Krishna? He's not doubting. He just said, you know, he was trying to serve Krishna and facing obstacles. So for a few moments to be shaken, that to be spiritual doesn't mean to not be human. As human beings, there is certain human reaction, and we accept that. So we will feel whatever way we will feel overwhelmed, and at that time we will just do the best that we can, which might not be the best, wisest thing to do. But we can always do course correction. We might react in a particular way. See, often it is not the first mistake that ruins us. It is, after we make the first mistake, we continue on the mistaken course. I mean, after somebody speaks something to us, 
there is a fault in me and I, so if I'm admitting it, I counter-attack that first. Okay, that's wrong. As soon as I realize it, let me stop it. But what happens is the first mistake, say somebody is driving a car and they steer off the road. Now, that is a mistake. They shouldn't have steered off the road. But then, they panic and then the car goes entirely off the road. They break at that time, so they, they can minimize the damage. So yes, the life difficulties come, our first reactions might be unhealthy. But we don't have to perpetuate those first reactions. As soon as we realize, we come back on track. And basically, the more our, we practice bhakti and our consciousness rises upwards, from uh, ignorance to passion to goodness to a transcendence, the more the healthier reactions will come faster. So we can't uh, predict what problems we are going to face and we can't even control how we respond. But the more we try to spiritualize our consciousness, the likelihood of the healthier reactions coming faster will be more. Yes. Yeah. We made one statement saying that less than this good gene than for the meaningful life something like that. Well, during the energy process, we are dealing with a group of people who are more less a city. How to address and then do some pitch strategy how to handle those and situation. They are more interested in the less a city. Okay, yeah. So people who are interested in seeking material pleasure alone. Uh, how can we persuade them? Well, we don't have to necessarily say that there's no pleasure in life or we shouldn't seek pleasure. It is that even people in general recognize to some extent that pleasure alone is not meaningful. See, many young people, they may just spend hours and hours watching video games or watching movies or just spending on time on Facebook or social media. And if somebody tells them, don't do it, they say, who are you telling stop? If you ask them honestly, there have been surveys done, most people after spending hours and hours on social media, they regret it. Even young people regret it. It's just that the way the world has been arranged, they feel this is more stimulating and life with all its responsibilities is more boring. So they prefer that. But if, you can say this is not just boring, if you take up some responsibility, try to do something challenging, you will grow in your life. So we don't have to necessarily, see the worst thing that we can do when we are presenting Krishna Consciousness to anyone and especially to young people is to present Krishna Consciousness as a set of rules. That's it, completely alienate people. I was at an interfaith meeting and there was this pastor, he, had, he said that in their, their religion they had done a survey of young people. What do you think of a priest? So it's a priest, so one young boy said, a priest is someone who is constantly worried that someone, somewhere, is having some fun. <laughs> so, their idea of religion is, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. So generally, we don't have to talk any about, talk any about any of the don'ts in issue. Just focus on the do's and how those con the do's connection brings, brings meaning and joy to our life. So if we focus on that, then, Rather than telling, don't do this, give like a multi-dimensional explanation of the purpose of life. Then, the don'ts themselves naturally start making sense. But unfortunately, we focus on the don'ts and then people feel that we are depriving them of pleasure. So at least initially, focus on the do's and how those do's are meaningful. And the don'ts will gradually come in place. Okay. Thank you. It's the last one. Oh, sir. Well, you have some close relatives or friends who are going through some obstacles. Let's say for example some life threatening disease and they are not Krishna conscious. How do you explain to them that there is a higher purpose to this problem? Okay. So if somebody is going through a life threatening disease, uh, how do we explain to them about that life has a higher purpose? It a lot depends on what state they are in. See, when Abhimanyu is killed, Krishna does not speak any philosophy to Arjuna. Krishna doesn't even mention that, oh, you're not body or the soul, don't be attached to Abhimanyu. He doesn't say anything like that. He, what he says essentially is that, oh, Arjuna Arjun is so angry and he's telling all your brothers, he says, are all your weapons just bangles? Could any of you protect my brother? So, Krishna tells him, Oh Arjun, your brothers are as grief struck as you are. Please don't increase their grief 
by speaking such harsh words. A worthy person tries to decrease the grief of others, not increase their grief. So he doesn't speak any philosophy. He's very empathic, he's very understanding, and he tries to, within that frame of reference, elevate it. So basically, people when they face some uh, face some life-threatening disease, then in their mental state goes through various phases. Maybe initially there is resentment. Maybe initially there is denial. No, it's not happening to me. Then there is resentment. Why is this happening to me? Then gradually there is acceptance. Okay, this has happened now. What can I do? So we have to, whatever phase they are in, we have to assist them the best way we can. So sometimes the best way we can preach is by not preaching. What that means is that we usually need to make a human connection before we can make a spiritual connection. Now if people feel that you know, we understand, we, are, we understand the pain they are going through, we are there to assist them, we are there to help them in whatever way we can, then gradually they become a little more receptive. So we shouldn't see people's distress as simply an opportunity to preach to them. Our purpose is to help them. And sometimes we help them by giving spiritual knowledge. Sometimes we just help them by being empathic and by being, by, and by being understanding. Sometimes we help them by practically assisting. Now once Prabhupada was in a um, place in America and the devotee, it's like a, a condo, the devotee just had one center on one side, there's an old lady staying on the other side. And this old lady was always complaining. The devotees were just, they had many of the devotees that come from hippie backgrounds. These people are so noisy, they're so messy. She was complaining and she was creating a lot of problems for the devotees. And now what happens for devotees, anybody who opposes devotion, that is a simple label, they are demons. <laughs> so the devotees came and told Prabhupada, Prabhupada, this lady is a demon. She's troubling her so much. So then Prabhupada had gone for a morning walk, Prabhupada heard about it. And then he came back. And he said, going back to their side, he went to that side, knocked on the door, and then she opened his eyes. And Prabhupada greeted her, Prabhupada talked politely with her. And typical old people talk. How are you doing? How are your children? Where what do they do? Where are you? And how is your health? Almost like 15 minutes or something, Prabhupada talked with her. And then Prabhupada just very cordially left. And the devotees wonder, Prabhupada did not tell her to chant Hare Krishna, Prabhupada did not please. There's a big question mark on their face. So Prabhupada said, sometimes old people become lonely. And then because of loneliness, they become irritable. So, and Prabhupada just left. And then after, uh, after some time that old lady came and met the devotees and she said, you know, Swamiji is such a nice person. And she like withdrew her complaints. So Prabhupada brought her closer to Krishna without speaking even one word about Krishna. So he just established a human connection. So it's not that we shouldn't speak philosophy, but we have to understand. See, most people need to feel understood before they become ready to understand. It like suppose you are sick and you go to a doctor. And then as soon as you sit at the doctor's chair, my patient's chair, the doctor says, okay, okay, take this medicine, take this medicine, take this medicine. Hey, I didn't tell you my symptoms also. I already know your symptoms. <laughs> now, even if the diagnosis is right, the prescription is also right. Unless the patient has the confidence that the prescription is right, the patient won't take it. So people need to feel understood before they become ready to understand. So when people are in distress, we have to find out how to establish a human connection with them. And if somebody is ranting, how can God be so cruel? Why did God do this to me? There is no need to think that I have to defend God over there. You know, God is God is actually big enough to even accommodate our anger to it. If somebody becomes angry towards God, we might we don't have to say that they are blaspheming God or something like that. No. At that time, it's just a human reaction. When Draupadi was attempted to be dishonored, she was saved. But after that, uh, nobody actually saw Krishna coming. It's just that her role was inexhaustible. And later on in the forest, Krishna came to meet her. And when Krishna came, Draupadi, Draupadi broke down. He says, Krishna, I am your friend, I am your relative, I am your devotee. I deserve your protection. Why did you come to protect me? And Krishna did say, how dare you challenge my perfect plan? Krishna played a very human role. He said, 
I didn't know about the gambling match. If I had known, I would have stopped it at all costs. Since I was in Dwarka and there was a demon, Shalva would attack Dwarka. And I was busy defending Dwarka. As soon as I came to know, I rushed here. Oh, Draupadi, I have heard how amid such distress you stuck through the dharma. Your devotion to dharma is glorious. And you will be glorified. And those who have dishonored, those who dishonored you, will be punished. Have faith. So, he consoled her, he encouraged her. So, he didn't... Uh, so, even if those people criticize God, or criticize, don't, don't try to... Unless they are ready, don't give philosophy. If they are in an emotional mood, just try to understand their emotions. Make them feel understood. See, when somebody doesn't feel understood, it is like... For just as we need air for breathing, our heart needs the oxygen. The oxygen is understanding. If we don't feel understood, then just like a person who is gasping for oxygen, they will hit someone, grab something, they will do anything. So like that, when people are not understood, they can speak all kinds of irrational things. And we start arguing with those irrational things, well, it doesn't work. Because they are gasping for the oxygen of understanding. Just hear them out. Just hear them out. Let them rant out whatever they want to. And when they come out, then find the right way. Okay. So thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada Ki. So there, I have written about 25 books.